Hello, and we are back to talking about antidepressants. We're going to talk uh, this time about what we call first and second generation antidepressants, primarily tricyclics, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, and drugs close to tricyclics, but not exactly which are the second generation or atypical antidepressants. We're going to start talking about tricyclics, which uh, are the first half of what we call the first generation antidepressants. Uh, as we talked in the last lecture, tricyclic antidepressants are so named because of their three ring molecular core, not because of their function. Unusual for a psychological drug, but uh, we're kind of stuck with that. Uh, the tricyclics are effective antidepressants. Uh, in addition to being effective antidepressants, they have been demonstrated to be effective in treating anxiety. That is, they have what we call anxiolytic properties, that is, they relieve anxiety. We're going to talk uh, after the midterm about anxiolytic drugs like benzodiazepines. We'll also talk later about some drugs that are what we call anxiogenic, that is, they cause anxiety. So it's under, important to understand what we mean by anxiolytic, relieving anxiety. So they are uh, anti-anxiety drugs. They're also shown to have analgesic properties, that is, pain relief properties. And we're going to talk uh, about that in more detail uh, as we move along. Some of the drugs we talked about with bipolar disorder also have analgesic properties. The SSRIs that are much more commonly used today are no more effective than the tricyclic antidepressants, but they are far less toxic and have fewer side effects. So while you get the same degree of relief from an SSRI, they have fewer side effects, and that's an important consideration. I want to first talk about their mechanism of action. As we've talked previously, uh, they primarily block the presynaptic reuptake transporter for norepinephrine and or serotonin, they also block the postsynaptic receptors for histamine, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine. And this is where a great deal of the side effects of tricyclics come from. So the benefit seems to come from the presynaptic reuptake transporter blocking, uh, whereas the side effects come from blocking the postsynaptic receptors for antihistamine, or sorry, for histamine, acetylcholine, and norepinephrine. So they're antihistamines, acetylcholine blockers, and norepinephrine blockers at the postsynaptic receptor. To further look at how uh, tricyclic function, well, we have them blocking the presynaptic reuptake transporter and the postsynaptic receptors. Again, most of the side effects come from blocking of those postsynaptic receptors. Blocking of histamine results in sedation, much like any other antihistamine, like Benadryl, great example, or which is uh, also known as diphenhydramine, has fairly severe sedating effects, and that's due to its antihistamine properties. So tricyclics can be very sedating. Blocking the acetylcholine receptor causes confusion, memory, and cognitive impairments, dry mouth, etc. We've talked already about what happens when we block acetylcholine, some severe side effects, and certainly we don't want any more cognitive impairments. We also know that blocking that acetylcholine receptor can really affect older adults and their cognitive functioning. Uh, the biggest problem with the norepinephrine blockade at the postsynaptic receptor is a drop in blood pressure. When people stand up, they can get dizzy, faint, and obviously that can result in injury. We want to avoid that, if at all possible. Most of the tricyclics have very similar pharmacokinetics. So I want to talk briefly about uh, the pharmacokinetic profile of tricyclics. They're well absorbed when administered orally, so they um, most of the drug is absorbed. It's a pretty effective way to administer the drug. They have relatively long half-lives. I urge you to look at Table 5.1 in your text. It reviews all of the antidepressants we're going to talk about. So as we move through, it's probably handy to keep that a copy of that nearby because we're certainly going to be referring to that quite a bit. Uh, some of the tricyclics have active metabolites, so obviously those active metabolites will increase the um, metabolic profile of the drug, so it will make it longer, because while the drug may be metabolized at the half-life, those active metabolites will extend the half-life. So the clinical effects can last up to four days, uh, longer in the elderly who are at greater risk for significant side effects. Later in the semester, we're going to talk about older adults uh, who um, metabolize drugs differently, and particularly more slowly. In terms of the pharmacological effects of tricyclics, again, they affect the presynaptic transporter proteins, primarily norepinephrine and serotonin. 
The clinical limitations of these drugs are that they have a slow onset of action, that it takes a while for you to get the antidepressant uh, properties. They have wide central nervous system effects, which are obviously problematic, and particularly problematic is that overdosage can be cardiotoxic and lethal. So giving a tricyclic antidepressant is going to be very risky in somebody who's at risk for suicide because these drugs can be used in an overdose and can be cardiotoxic. So uh, there is certainly some caution warranted whenever someone is taking one of these particular drugs. And we certainly want to make sure that patients are not taking more than they're supposed to be. Uh, to provide a summary of tricyclics, uh, they have no recreation or addictive liability, so that's important. Uh, in depressed patients, they do elevate mood, increase physical activity, and can improve appetite and sleep patterns. They're as effective as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, but they do have more complications and are more toxic. They are also effective analgesics in clinical pain syndromes, particularly in peripheral neuropathy, uh, migraine headaches, fibromyalgia, chronic back pain. Uh, of course, they still have the significant side effects that are associated with their antidepressant use. So it's important to understand that while they can be used for these conditions, they do have some side effects, but they don't have the addictive properties that some of the other drugs for relieving pain that we're going to talk about later in the term. I want to focus now on the side effects of tricyclics. Obviously, they can be sedating, um, as other antihistamines are. Now, importantly, this can be a benefit for depressive patients who are suffering from insomnia. They can take these before they go to bed. It will help them sleep, and then they'll get the antidepressant properties over the rest of the day. So that's a, a potential benefit to that sedating effect. In long-term treatment, they may develop tolerance to many of these side effects. Um, there are, however, significant effects on memory and cognition. And again, there is the potentially life-threatening cardiac complications. So these need to be carefully monitored. Uh, tricyclics are probably not something that should be used in children or adolescents. Um, certainly their safety is uh, questionable. And so I would, I would certainly argue against um, treating adolescents or children with these particular drugs. So those are the tricyclics. You've probably seen um, them come up in uh, drug interaction warnings. You see them on TV. You know, do not take if you're taking a tricyclic antidepressant. Um, the next class of drugs certainly has that, what we call MAOIs. Um, and there are warnings on almost every over-the-counter drug that you shouldn't take them along with an MAOI. So let's move to talk about those next. Again, this is part of our first generation of antidepressants, and these all came out in the 60s and 70s. So the MALIs um, inhibit monoamine oxidase, and monoamine oxidase regulates the amount of monoamine neurotransmitters as well as other substances, but the mechanism of action, that is how they affect depression, is by limiting monoamine oxidase. Unfortunately, there are other things that are broken down by monoamine oxidase, by monoamine oxidase that uh, are not particularly good for us. They can be toxic if they build up in, in high levels. There are three MAOIs available, all have serious side effects, and all potentially have fatal food drug interactions. So these are very complicated drugs to take and certainly are probably the last line of choice because of these fatal food drug interactions. Um, any adrenaline-like drugs that are found in nasal or anti-asthma medications uh, have potentially fatal uh, interactions. Any foods containing tyramine, which would be cheeses, wines, beers, uh, liver, and some beans will contain tyramine. Tyramine uh, would build up and can cause uh, toxic side effects. Uh, what happens is excessive tyramine increases, increases blood pressure and then puts patients at risk for heart attack. Uh, so we clearly want to be very careful whenever prescribing these drugs because it's going to greatly limit uh, the patient's overall uh, life. So I want to think very carefully about that. Uh, the clinical effect is not actually related to the elimination half-life. So we're not going to talk much about the pharmacokinetics because the two aren't exactly related. While the pharmacokinetics of the MALI itself are relatively short, its effects are really long. And so what happens is, um, remember what this drug does is it inhibits monoamine oxidase. And so what you have to do then is regenerate more monoamine oxidase in order to overcome the effects of the drug. So this takes about 10 to 14 days for the body to reproduce enough monoamine oxidase 
to get back to normal functioning. So the clinical effects can last for 10 to 14 days, and so any dietary restrictions have to be followed for two weeks after discontinuing these drugs. So um, going on and off them is, not, is no easy task. They are as effective as other drugs, and they've also been used to treat atypical depression, anorexia nervosa, bulimia, bipolar disorder, and panic disorder. It's one of the few drugs that have been shown to have any effect in eating disorders. Now, there is some potential alternative use uh, that other antidepressants might not be effective for. So those are our first generation antidepressants, the tricyclics and the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, or the MAOIs. Um, not a great deal of clinical use currently. There are some clinical uses for them, obviously, outside of depression. There are better antidepressants that are used more often, and we're going to focus more on those. It's the reason why I don't go into great detail about the individual drug names, because for me it's more important that you understand the class of drugs and how they work, and we'll talk more about the specific, newer, more commonly used drugs and their individual profiles later on. So let's get into the second generation, or what we call the atypical antidepressants, and I'm going to move through each of these relatively quickly. Um, most of these have fairly similar profiles. Some of these you will have heard of, some you will have not. Um, Mepratiline or Ludiomil was first clinically available, second generation antidepressant. Has few therapeutic advantages over other drugs that may cause seizures. So if um, a doctor is prescribing this first, they're probably not a good doctor. Um, amoxetine or Ascendant is primarily a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Uh, it is clinically effective particularly efficacious at treating anxiety and agitation, but it does have some Parkinsonian-like side effects. So be careful with that. Um, as a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, it might potentially be useful as an ADHD drug. Um, certainly some of the ADHD drugs we'll talk about are um, often uh, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Finally, we have trazodone. Um, which is a short-acting version which treats insomnia. It has the short-acting version is very short-acting and in fact probably its only clinical use is in treating insomnia and that's the Deceril. Um, the Electro, which is a longer-acting, uh, slower dissolving formulation, uh, does treat major depressive disorder but does have some significant side effects. Uh, in males, in particular, priapism, which is a, an erection which will not go down, which lasts over four hours. You've probably all heard this on the um, Viagra commercials. Uh, this could be a very serious side effect. Um, and so something to watch out for, probably not the best drug. And tends to be used, trazodone tends to be used more as a sedative than as an antidepressant. Clomiparine, uh, or NFRNL, is a mixed serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's similar to the flaxine, which we're going to talk about later. Um, has similar efficacy and side effects to tricyclics and is oftentimes used to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. So again, very quick introduction to the older generation antidepressants. We're going to focus most of our attention on SSRIs and newer antidepressants.